Okay, go. <laughs> we definitely know it's being recorded. <laughs> we like to begin and end our meetings on time, so we'll get started, even as some folks may continue to enter. Being a faith-based organization, we begin our events with a reflection to set the tone for our gathering. I will ask the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, Loretta Getline, to offer that now. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, event tonight. <clears throat> My name is Greta Getline. I'm the Dean of the Episcopal Cathedral in Burlington, Vermont, and it's a pleasure to be with you. In my faith tradition, in our faith tradition, which is Christianity, we make a mature affirmation of our faith as either an older teenager or an adult. And this is not just an affirmation of our faith, but also an affirmation of how we will live into that faith, how it will inform us, how it will transform us and how it will guide us in transforming the world. In the Episcopal expression of Christianity, which is my tradition, we call this affirmation uh, confirmation. And it is an adult affirmation of the promises that we made in baptism, either as, a ch as an infant or a child, when maybe those promises were made on our behalf by our parents, or as an adult, when we make an affirmation of our faith. And whether it's baptism or confirmation, we are asked this question. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? We are here tonight to ask you to respect the dignity of incarcerated women the dignity of living in a clean and safe space, the dignity of receiving timely and appropriate healthcare, the dignity of getting through a day without being assaulted physically or psychologically, the dignity of being called by their chosen name. Gandhi famously said, be the change you wish to see in the world. We pray that you will see the change that needs to happen in women's facilities here in Vermont, and then have the courage to be that change. I close with this prayer. O oh God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth, to confront one another without hatred or bitterness, and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Getline, and welcome everyone. Again, my name is Fran Carlson, I'm a member of the VIA Corrections Reform Local Organizing Ministry. We extended personal invitations to Jim Baker, the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections, and to all members of the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee of our state legislature. We give a special welcome to those who are joining us tonight. I will introduce them in a moment. Among the members we were unable to entice here tonight our vice chair, chair of the committee, Representative Alice Emmons, who's at a family affair, Representative Maxine Grad, and Representative Butch Shaw. Again, thank you so much for those of, uh, of you who joined us tonight. I in, as I introduce you, please unmute yourself and tell us the district you serve. We will begin with our senators and go alphabetical alphabetically after first identifying the chair and then follow the same pattern with our representative. Chair of the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, Senator Dick Sears. Good morning, good afternoon, I'm used to saying good morning. Um, Dick Sears, State Senator, Bennington County and the town of Wilmington. 
Thank you. Senator Phil Baruth. Uh, good evening, everyone. I represent Chittenden County in the Senate. Senator Cheryl Hooker. Thank you, Francis, and thank you all for having us. Um, I'm Cheryl Hooker, Senator from Rutland County. Senator Ginny Lyon. Good evening. Thank you for having us here. Uh, I represent Chittenden County in the Senate. Senator Corey Parent. I guess not quite he, here. Yeah, he won't be able to join us until seven. Oh, good. Representative Trevor Squirrel. And Representative Teresa Wood. Okay. And of course, we also have uh, the, our interim commissioner of the Department of Corrections, uh, Mr. Jim Baker. I guess he can just say hi if he's with us. Good evening, folks. Good, great. We appreciate your joining us tonight. We are grateful for the work of all you do for our state regarding our correction system. We know that carrying out the joint tasks of keeping the public safe and respecting the dignity of those who are incarcerated are not easy to balance. As people of faith, we strongly believe in valuing all human lives and giving everyone a second chance to succeed after they've made mistakes. We are convinced that you too share these values or you would not be doing the work you do. Our research over the se last several months led us to concentrate on reforms that are most pertinent to the woman's facility, Fittenden Regional Corrections Facility. Although many of our comments tonight pertain to the system as a whole. As you will hear in our research report, when we identify problems or criticize systems, we also suggest solutions. It is our hope that you will carefully consider our proposals and you will commit to working with us in the future to use them to advance the values we all share. In addition to our legislative guests, we have also asked several people who have personal experience interacting with our correction system who will share their stories with us. You will meet them shortly. We are so grateful for their willingness to be with us tonight. So that everyone can see where we are headed um, in our agenda, our Zoom administrator is placing it in the chat. First, a word about how this will act, work. As you will see, we have a lot to cover in a small amount of time. For that reason, we're inviting only those on the agenda to speak. Those who are sharing their personal stories will each have two to three minutes to talk about their experiences. After our research report, we will ask questions of the commissioner and the legislators about proposals we are making. Please answer these initial questions with a simple yes or no answer. After the questions you've been posed, each of you will be given two minutes to elaborate on your answer and to share your own thinking about these issues. Our timekeeper, Catherine Cook, will make sure we stay on time. She will let our speakers know that their speaking time is coming to an end by holding up a yellow warning sign. Speakers will then have 30 seconds to wrap up their remark. At the end of their time, she will hold up a red stop sign to indicate that our guest time has ended. All of our guests have been informed prior to the event about these ground rules and have agreed to the structure of tonight's meeting. Now, one of our VIA leaders will give the VIA credential. Good evening, my name is Sue Brooks and I am a member of Christ Church Presbyterian and Vermont Interfaith Action. Vermont Interfaith Action is a faith-based grassroots coalition of 68 member and affiliated congregations. We include individuals from a wide range of faith communities and we have member congregations in the Burlington area, Central Vermont and Southern Vermont. As people of faith, we share common beliefs and values about the dignity and worth of all members of the larger communities in which we reside. We believe in social action 
social justice and take action on issues that we believe need to be addressed in order to assure that all people in our communities experience a rich quality of life and are treated with compassion in their day-to-day -day living. VIA's motto is transforming people and communities. Transformation is achieved by empowering members within our congregations to lift their voices in the public arena, to speak out on issues that they care about. And we transform our communities by conducting research on policy issues with decision makers, and then bringing them together to find solutions to social issues that need to be changed. VIA is the member of Faith in Action, the largest faith-based community organizing network in the world with 48 affiliates in 20 states, as well as Haiti, El Salvador, and Rwanda. While FIA organizations are rooted in local communities, affiliates actively work together to impact state and national level political policies. VIA's goal is to create the hope, power, knowledge, and political will needed to make dignified and respectful living environments a reality for all Vermonters. Thank you, Sue. Next, we will have a roll call of faith communities present. So good evening, my yeah. sisters and brothers. Uh, my name is Earl Cooper Camp. I'm the pastor of the Church of the Good Shepherd in Barrie. So this evening, uh, we'd like to welcome each one of you and recognize uh, those who have come from our member congregations. So when I call out uh, your faith community, uh, please click either on the thumbs up button down in the re under the reactions and uh, fr feel free to unmute yourself and make some noise as well. So first of all, uh, tonight we have members of the Cathedral Church of St. Paul in Burlington. Yay! And Christ, Yay. Uh, Christ Church Yay. also in Burlington. Yay. From the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Burlington. From the First Congregational Church of Burlington. And the College Street Congregational Church. Yay! <laughs> so uh, any other congregations or folks from the greater Burlington area? Welcome. And then uh, in central Vermont, we have the Church of the Good Shepherd. Yeah. Christ Episcopal Church in Montpelier. Also the First Presbyterian Church in Barrie. The Barrie Congregational Church. And the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. So any other congregations from central Vermont? Welcome. Moving a little further south, uh, we have members from the Guilford Community Church. Present and accounted for. All right. And St. Michael's Episcopal Church uh, in Brattleboro. Any others from uh, Wyndham County? And to the southwest, we have uh, people from St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Bennington. And also Congregation Bethel in Bennington. And any others from down in Bennington County? I'm moving back up to the Upper Valley, uh, the First Congregational Church of Thetford, welcome. And from St. Barnabas Church in Norwich. What, 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 what? <laughs> and any other congregation uh, folks from the Upper Valley? Well, we're so glad you're here and can join us for this important action this evening. So thank you so much for your presence with us. Thank you, Earl. We have compiled a great deal of research over the past year, and now we would like to share a summary of that work. There we go. <clears throat> so the, the Corrections Reform Local Organizing Ministry of Vermont Interfaith Action has conducted extensive research over the past year on Vermont correctional institutions. Our group comprises VIA leaders from the Cathedral Church of St. Paul and Christ Church Presbyterian in Burlington and Church of the Good Shepherd in Barrie. 
While we have been conducting our research, the, the Vermont Department of Corrections, or DOC, has also been under intense public scrutiny because of allegations of sexual abuse in the women's prison, Chittenden Regional Corrections Facility, or CRCF. A report of investigation by the law firm Downs Racklin Martin, referred to as the DRM report, was conducted. This report listed the cases of abuse and gave recommendations on how the problem could be addressed. The Vermont Legislature passed H-435 this session to act on some of these recommendations. This bill will create a Corrections Monitoring Commission to provide advice and counsel regarding the reporting of sexual misconduct and the accountability of corrections officers. In addition, an internal corrections investigative unit will be established. This body will be responsible for compliance with federal law and investigation of possible violations within the department. <clears throat> We at Vermont Interfaith Action view these as positive steps, but we would like to take a more comprehensive view of the culture in our correction system and make some recommendations of our own. Specifically, there are four areas we want to address. Reinstating the position of Director of Women and Family Services to make supportive programs more robust changing the culture of CRCF by training, mentoring, and holding accountable the corrections officers to utilize trauma-based and other more restorative and better informed methods of interaction with residents. Connecting residents to educational and therapeutic opportunities. Providing ample preparation for and supports after release. Each section that follows will make the case for why we think these recommendations are important. One important improvement to the current correction system would be to reestablish the position at the DOC of Director of Women and Family Services, as suggested in the DRM report. One of the tasks of this reinstated position would be to establish and implement a training and best practices program for gender responsiveness in the women's prison for all CRCF staff. Years ago, women's, Vermont's Women's Correctional Institution started out as a mental health facility. It was set up at the Dale facility in 2000 in Waterbury. With national focus on gender-specific programs for incarcerated women, Dale was primarily a social work program focusing on mental health. It could hold 44 women. This number had remained consistent for many years, and then the opioid crisis hit. A second women's facility was set up in Windsor with a capacity of more than 200. Women with short-term mental health problems stayed at Dale, and sentenced women went to Windsor, where there was a capacity for around 200. About 175 women were incarcerated. In 2009, the two programs were integrated and the women were moved to the Northwest Correctional Facility in Swanton. This location was not ideal for families because it was so remote, but the infrastructure was ideal. It is a large facility with natural light, room for many programs, including work programs, and outdoor space. It had a positive effect on the women. In 2011, the women were moved to CRCF in South Burlington, where mental health services are not adequate. There is little opportunity for outdoor activities, space is cramped, and the facilities are in disrepair. In addition, there used to be a position at Vermont DOC of a Director of Women and Family Services. The director at that time was instrumental in bringing in women's programs like Kids Apart, mentoring, job training, and support for survivors of domestic abuse by partnering with organizations such as the Lund Family Home, Mercy Connections, Vermont Works for Women, and Divas. This position was eliminated in 2015. This was a great loss not only for the women in prison but also for the men because often good women's programs filter out to the men's prisons. Another good reason for reinstating this position is learning from the example of the state of Maine. 
We at VIA communicated several times with the Deputy Commissioner of Maine DOC, Ryan Thornell. And we should say that we know that UVM professor and DOC consultant Kathy Fox and CRCF Superintendent Teresa Messier are in a learning community with the Maine DOC so that they can bring best practices back to Vermont. But we will go ahead and share with you what we have learned. The Maine DOC has a Director of Women's Services that reports directly to Deputy Commissioner Thornell. He stated that this director has transformed women's services in the Maine correction system. A trauma-informed, service-driven approach has been taken. The goal is to give the women services that are comparable to what they would get in the community. Maine DOC tries to get the women out of the system as fast as they can. Women come to prison for very different reasons than men. Statistically, most of them have or are coping with abuse, neglect, and poverty. They pose a very low risk to the community. Programmatic interventions coordinated by a dedicated staff person and tailored to women's needs would serve them and public safety better than simply doing time. As faith communities, we believe there is a moral imperative to change the culture of the Vermont DOC to a new paradigm. Again, we can look to our neighbor Maine for examples of a different approach. Deputy Commissioner Thornell explained that Maine's premise is to create and sustain a culture of wellness, not only for those who are incarcerated, but also for staff. A culture of wellness would include measures to improve and maintain physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Maine DOC considers its job to be to identify the needs in these areas and meet them. Culture change is never easy because it depends on belief and behavior changes. New expectations must be communicated by specific training. The Maine DOC trains their staff in communication and de-escalation. They have a curriculum called CR2, Creating Regulation and Resilience. It is trauma-informed and gender responsive, aiming to shift how staff approaches communication so it is not a power and control dynamic, but a grounded conversation dynamic. Changes in belief and behavior must be reinforced with follow-up mentoring. The DRM report recommended a mentorship program among DOC staff to instill the types of conduct and practices that DOC would like to encourage and to provide support and guidance to younger staff. The Maine DOC has on-the-ground supervision and modeling of behavior in their line supervisors. They have sergeants in-house whose number one job is to coach and model appropriate behavior for other staff. Their job is to redirect when staff are working long hours and, encourage, and encountering frustrating situations so that they can be supported in improving their own wellness. If staff are not trained in wellness for themselves, it is difficult for them to instill wellness in the corrections residents. The basis of treating the residents should be helping them become the best persons they can be, awakening their human potential. Also, better preparing corrections officers and providing a mentoring system may entice more people to apply and ensure they stay in their positions longer. Currently, there is a lack of corrections officers and they do not generally stay employed long term. The DRM report suggests an emphasis on recognition of excellent service that adheres to the training and lives up to the mentoring. In addition to presenting the new expectations and following up with mentoring, there must also be evaluation and accountability. The DRM report recommended establishing and implementing a staff on-duty body camera program to better monitor interactions between staff and residents. Maine DOC has corrections officers wear body cams in all facilities. They have found body cams have captured incidents and comments that have led to increased accountability in the situation, 
preventing situations from escalating, and supporting reports of staff and residents in different situations. Looking at the stated principles of Vermont DOC, which include belief in the inherent dignity and worth in all human beings, in treating people with respect and dignity, and in teamwork and the process of continuous improvement, it is obvious that Vermont leaders desire to create a positive culture in our prison system. However, there needs to be further work at activating these pr principles. This further work could bring about a culture of wellness across the system. An important part of the culture of wellness is education. Maine DOC's research shows that education for the residents is extremely important, and the higher the level of education, the less likely a person is to return to prison. Education also makes the resident more ready for employment, especially when the education programs are tailored to employment opportunities in the state. Maine DOC provides access to varied education programs as soon as possible after incarceration begins. Each corrections facility in Maine offers high school, college, graduate school, and vocational training. The vocational training programs are nationally certified, and the Department of Labor identifies growing trades and occupations so that training can be focused on immediate employment on release. Sources of funding for these educational opportunities come from the state and community colleges, Second Chance Pell Grants, employer training, and the Empl Inmate Benefit Program. In contrast, the programs at CRCF are much less varied, even before COVID-19 interrupted most of them. The DRM report states that UVM offers non-credit classes in classics, literature mythology, English, composition, and statistics. Given the recent pruning of liberal arts departments at UVM, some of these offerings will likely no longer be available. A bright spot in the Vermont DOC is the Community High School of Vermont, which is fully accredited and provides a high school diploma, not a GAD, to any resident who wants one in all of the Vermont correctional facilities. By state statute, all Vermonters are to receive a high school education on or before the age of 23. This requirement applies to all, regardless of their status as offenders. The community high school was created 50 years ago to fulfill this goal for those who are age 23 or under and incarcerated. In recent years, the understanding of the mission of CHS has expanded beyond the statutory requirement of providing high school diplomas to high school dropouts. Many of the corrections residents have managed to graduate from high school, but lack academic proficiency to obtain employment. CHS addresses these educational deficiencies and in addition provides work readiness training that meets recognized industry standards. Employment training could be further enhanced by coordinating with the Department of Labor to concentrate on industries with the most potential to hire and therefore provide the best chance of employment after release. The most recent expansion of CHS has been to incorporate a therapeutic model that addresses the criminogenic needs of the students. A collaborative approach has been adopted with those programs that treat substance use disorder, socialization and behavior problems, and mental health issues. What has emerged is an integrative approach to education designed to serve the academic, economic, and therapeutic needs of the incarcerated student population. On the subject of substance use disorder, we also want to recognize that the Vermont DOC has been a leader in providing Medicated Assistant Treatment, or MAT, for those who begin their incarceration struggling to recover from opioid addiction. An assessment is conducted at intake when MAT can first be prescribed and can be continued for up to 120 days. The community high school has earned the praise and respect of its graduates and students, not only because of the quality of its programs, 
It has done so because the students recognize and appreciate the care and understanding of the staff and teachers who treat the students with respect and offer them hope and possibility of a better life. As positive as these developments are for CHS and its associated rehabilitative programs, they are subject to the limitations and problems of the Department of Corrections, such as level funding by the Vermont Legislature for seven years, reduction of staff, lack of funding for professional development and continuing education for teachers and corrections officers, leadership turnovers, and antiquated facilities, all of which are in abundant evidence at the CRCF. In addition to high school education, we would encourage credit-earning college and graduate courses as well. Educational opportunities could be more easily accessed and more cost-effective online, but our DOC has not yet implemented the possibility of this access due to security concerns. We feel that there must surely be a way to provide structured, protected Internet access. While we, when we at VIA first began our focus on corrections reform back in 2014, we won required use of a checklist by case managers in preparation of residents for release. This was a big step forward at the time because it ensures that at least 30 days and up to 12 months before release, such items as ID, health care providers and treatment plans, and immediate basic needs like clothing, food, housing and transportation are attended to for those being released. But to improve the preparation for release further, additional steps should be taken. The DRM report specifically states that support for residents re-entering the community would reduce recidivism and reduce pressure on current corrections resources. Suggestions taken from the example of Maine include requiring that the re-entry process start nine months before release and designating a re-entry center. Maine actually, Maine actually has a facility for women, which is a state-of-the-art pre-release center with a lower security level. The majority of women are housed there. Is my voice coming through okay? I think someone may have turned on a second device. Yes, oh, well, yes. okay. I, I think we muted uh, the problem. No. Okay. Oh, now I have to find where I was. <laughs> Maine actually has a facility for women, which is a state-of-the-art pre-release center with a lower security level. The majority of women are housed there. It resembles a college dormitory more than a prison. The culture is much more relaxed. There is more conversation between staff and residents. The focus is on communication and de-escalation rather than punitive measures. VIA would also like to encourage DOC to expand its collaboration with nonprofit organizations in the community so that support is provided during incarceration and then continued more seamlessly once residents are released. We found in our research, and the DRM report concurs, that many valuable services can be provided by community partners. Vermont Works for Women, for instance, offers life skills and readiness classes, career assessments and job coaching, assistance in creating or updating resumes and cover letters, supervision and support through on-the-job work experiences, assistance in finding and keeping a job, and support during the interview process. Vermont Works for Women also creates opportunities for residents to meet potential employers who can answer questions about employability, strategies, and skills in job seeking. They have in the past partnered with Cabot Cheese, a UVM farming program, Chef Brian and the Kitchen Community, Community Kitchen Academy, and plumbing and electrical pre-apprenticeship programs. Unfortunately, most of these collaborations were halted during the pandemic. One bright spot during the pandemic was two temporary positions of regional reentry support specialists, but sadly those positions were funded with pandemic relief funds and have either ended or will end soon. 
The sudden release of many prisoners near the beginning of the pandemic helped VWW discover gaps in services they provide. We heard in our research that there is not enough communication. Residents are often unaware of available programs and opportunities. There are no criteria for when inmates can begin employment readiness, and except for temporary positions, no re-entry support outside of Chittenden County. Another source of excellent programming is, Mercy, is from Mercy Connections, which has been mentoring residents both while they are incarcerated and for a year after release. This program, too, is seriously hindered, especially during COVID, because computer access is not readily available to the residents. Mercy Connections also works to help residents maintain essential connections with family members and others in the community when appropriate. They recognize that the women they are mentoring have been caught in the web of intergenerational poverty, and they hope with new ideas of what is possible these women will have the opportunity to change. In summary, while we at VIA recognize that some progress has been made in adopting restorative practices and creating a culture of wellness in our correction system, and while we see the good intentions of DOC and legislative leadership, we feel that putting the good ideas into effect on the ground has simply not happened adequately. DOC and the legislature seem to be reactive to pro problems rather than being proactive in creating and sustaining systems that prevent the difficulties from happening. We hope that by bringing proactive measures to light, we can encourage DOC and legislative leaders to work with us to improve the system. Thank you very much, Linda. We hope that our research report has given everyone a thorough overview of the issues we need to address. Behind this research are the lives and the stories of those whose life experiences have put them into contact with the correction system. We welcome them to share their stories with all of us tonight. Tammy Wood. Hi. Um... <clears throat> My name is uh, Tammy Wood, and I'm a, um, a, me a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, I am uh, the um, corrections chair for the state. Um, and my role in that is to coordinate efforts throughout the state to bring meetings and literature into our facilities, <clears throat> which has been hard this last year. Um, personally, I have um, been involved with um, coming in to bring meetings um, since the 90s. Uh, and at that time, we used to be able to pick them up and bring them out to meetings. Um, it's very different now, we just, we just go in. And um, so I have, a, I have long um, involvement with, um, with uh, volunteering at the, at the correctional facility for the women. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, uh, you know, I was asked if, uh, if there were some women that I know um, who could come and talk. And uh, so it's interesting that, you know, one of the, one of the rules for being a volunteer is that um, there's no contact allowed with inmates once they are out, um, which, you know, as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous just really isn't how that community works and thrives and helps people stay uh, sober and, you know, deal with their substance abuse. Um, you know, we have, we have daily contact, we share phone numbers. So, um, you know, I see where that can be a problem. So we can't find anybody cause we're not allowed to have contact. We're not allowed that information or we wouldn't be able to be a volunteer. Um, and, uh, um, you know, one of the other things that I've thought about is, um, you know, a sponsorship program where, you know, uh, like you were talking, you know, you connect with people and get them ready for coming out. You know, um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the women are in the facilities because of substance abuse. So um, I think having that be addressed is, is so important. 
Um, you know, right now, uh, I don't know what's going to happen after the pandemic is over, but um, during the pandemic, they, we've been able to bring in meetings only through um, literature or um, we start, started a newsletter, we send in some other things that are PDFs that can go on tablets um, so they can read something. And, and I hope that they get to keep the tablets after that because, um, you know, my personal feeling is there's not enough meetings as it is already. So the more that they can have that would be better. Um, and uh, um, we were just notified actually that um, we're gonna lose space at the uh, meeting spaces that we have already at the facility, which means we're gonna to have to be grouped with other people. So I don't even know what that means as, you know, when people in recovery really um, uh, count on uh, anonymity for the most part, you know, like, I don't know how that's gonna work with, with um, being part of other groups. Um, it feels like they're, they're um, getting less services by losing a couple of rooms that we use for a private meeting place. Um, so I guess we'll find out more about that, but that's, that's a fairly new um, development that we were just hearing about. Um, and uh, I guess that's all I have. I just had uh, a few minutes to, to share, but um, uh, I'm happy to, to talk to people or to, to work with people to, um, you know, bring more support to the women. And I, I love the report that you did. So thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And now we'll have a written statement from Carmen Gutilla read by Sue Brooks. you're muted you need to unmute yourself my name is sue brooks i'm with christ church presbyterian and via and i will be reading the testimony of carmen gutia who's unable to be here tonight this is carmen's story of her experiences as an incarcerated person at crcf So many things about my life since I've been detained here at CRCF because of Vermont's court system, trial backup has concerned me. By May, I will have lived here unconvicted, unsentenced, charged with a crime I did not commit for three years. My last visit with my family was the last week of January, 2020. Little did I know that lifestyles both inside and outside the facility would be completely changed. COVID-19 was killing people in the US. Beginning in March, all our units became separated from other units in the dining hall, recreation yard, gym, and in-house classes. Facility population dropped below 90 residents. March, 2020 was here. All family visitation, was suspended. Outside volunteers were not allowed in. Classes and programs inside were canceled along with library visits. No more contractors such as Divas, Vermont Works for Women, and Phoenix House were removed. I was required to finish my UVM college course online in order to get full credit for the semester, which I did. CRCF staff began to set up Bravo, Delta, and Echo units for quarantine. My unit, Echo, was on standby if another unit was needed for quarantine, which did occur on January 26, 2021. At that time, we were moved into a disciplinary unit, Foxtrot. This unit has no electricity in the cells, windows barely opened, and because it is a secured unit, cell doors were locked most of the time. Those of us who normally resided in ECHO unit lived in these harsh conditions for a period of 10 days. The rest of the facility was on modified lockdown. Minimal movement in hallways unless escorted by corrections officers. December, January, and February, we might've gotten four days 
outside recreation because the staff was so busy moving residents in and out of quarantine units. They were constantly serving meals and mopping and spraying unit services after every use. When the threat of the virus was near, we had to go into full lockdown. This meant staying in our cells except to use the bathroom one person at a time. And after each one, there was a necessary sanitation process. On January 31st, 2021, Interim DOC Commissioner Jim Baker told the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions that he was concerned about inmates' isolation. He spoke of the concerns of isolation over that past year, the mental stress of becoming sick fueled anxiety and depression in our community of 90 plus women and staff. As of January 31st, 2021, 50 employees and 247 inmates had tested positive for the virus. If it had not been for Teresa Messier, CRCF superintendent, and the rest of the staff here at this facility, those of us living here would not have stayed healthy. Staff here work back to back 16 hour days to keep CRCF running well. Some of them were burned out, exhausted, and eventually found employment elsewhere. For the last two years, staffing the corrections officers has been a constant problem with no solutions to keep new hires employed here. Another casualty due to COVID-19 is the lack of education, programming, and rehabilitation to help these ladies succeed on the outside and survive while being here. During this pandemic, we were locked up most of the time in order to keep the facility safe. What a shame that we couldn't get the vaccine when originally planned as part of phase two. So many, a shocking amount of women have met their death by going back out with little ambition needed to keep them away from killer drugs. Do not think that we had a lot of help for that pre-COVID, for that pre-COVID, but our small community did have other things to think about and work on other than just somebody's drugs. If we had gotten vaccinated earlier, it may well have been able to save the eight women who died over just a couple of months. All of them I knew well. They were activists, writers, poets, funny, helpful, eager to learn to help themselves and others. We will miss them very much. And now Tiffany, who was released 18 to 20 months ago. went through being pregnant and giving birth while incarcerated and having to go back to the prison afterwards, which was heartbreaking. Um, I experienced the, the COs were very, they weren't very nice to us. Um, they like to sexually harass us. They would just say stuff or try to touch us or make comments about our charges and like just different things that were really inappropriate and all the time. I mean, it's really, it's horrible. Um, you know, and then to be, I also feel like they look down on us for having like addiction issues, a lot of us or mental health issues, which most of us have both. And you know, there's no access to treatment. I mean, even just to get into a group, one of the substance abuse groups for Phoenix mm -hmm. House, I had to wait like nine months one time just to get on. I was on a list from the time I got there until then to even get to do the groups. Like that's, that's how little access there is to any treatment. Abuse. And what about for mental health? Were you, did you have any access to mental health treatment? No, I didn't at all, pretty much. <laughs> at no. all. Like, I luckily, if I was lucky, I saw the psychiatric nurse practitioner for 10 minutes every six months. 
you know, and that was just to prescribe meds and she would just get you out of there. I mean, it really, there was no therapy or treatment or, you know, and that's, you know, people think that when they send individuals to jail, that they are helping them and they're helping them to get better and they're helping them, you know, with their issues and their, you know, mental health and their substance problems, all these things. But the reality is they are making it worse. <laughs> they are traumatizing us significantly and making it worse. Like, you know, especially to be someone that did so much time just ultimately for being um, poor, you know, like I didn't have a place to live or yeah. family to go to. So I had to sit in jail and like, I, I lost a child because of that. And I, you know, I've like experienced tremendous hardship because of it. And, um, Okay, thank you very much, uh, all of our neighbors for, for being truthful and honest about your experiences. Um, and now it's time for us to ask the commissioner and our legislators to make commitments to the specific proposals that we are putting forward. We have four overarching questions and we would like to ask each of you to respond with a simple yes or no at first. Afterwards, each person will have time to elaborate on their answer and present some of their own thinking on these issues. After Penny unmutes and asks the first question, I will call on each of you for a one word answer in the same order I introduced you. Thank you, Fran. Will you commit to reinstate the position of Director of Women and Family Services, including committing the necessary funds. Senator Sears. Qualified, yes. Senator Baruth. Uh, I guess a qualified yes also. Senator Hooker. Uh, yes, with qualifications. Senator Lyons. Yes. Senator Perrin. Qualified, yes. Representative Squirrel. Representative Wood. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Sorry, I was here. Representative I, Woods, answer. Yes, sorry, I was on mute. I said a qualified yes as well. Okay, thank you. All righty, Penny. Question two. Alrighty. Uh, Number the second question is in, to ensure that, uh, will you ensure that the CRCF corrections officers are given the training and mentoring to utilize trauma-based and gender-informed methods of interaction with CRCF residents and are held accountable to using these? Senator Sears? Yes, with comments. Senator Baruth? I I will answer all of these with yes or no and qualification because I, I find it impossible to say simple yes or no. So yes with explanation. Senator Hooker? Yes, with qualification. Senator Lyons? Yes. Senator Perrin? Uh, yes, with qualification. And I don't think Representative Squirrel is here. So Representative Wood? Uh, I just wanna say that this is um, my actual first um, term on this committee. So I have a, a lot to learn, but this, it to makes total sense to me. So I definitely support the concept, um, but I have a lot to learn in terms of what's being provided now. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Okay, third question. Will you commit to connecting CRCF residents with more robust educational and therapeutic opportunities, including committees the necessary, committing the necessary funds? Senator Sears? Yes, with qualification. Senator Baruth? Yes, with qualification. Senator Hooker? Yes. 
Senator Lyons. Yes. Senator Parent. Yes, with qualifications. Representative Wood. Um, yes, similar to my previous response. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Fourth question, uh, will you commit to providing ample preparation for and support after release, including committing the necessary funds? Senator Sears? Yes, and I'll explain. Senator Baruth? Yes, with explanation. Senator Hooker? Yes, with some concerns. Senator Lyons? Yes. Senator Parent? Uh, yes, with qualifications. Representative Wood? Uh, yes, similar response to before. Commissioner Baker? Yes, with explanations. Um, Senator Sears, I invite you to unmute and expand on your answers. All of them are just one. On, on number one, I would say that um, I don't, I, that, that should happen. Um, and I don't know what the cost would be. I don't know if it will be in the governor's budget, but I would not support it. Where we come up with the funds for it. Number two should be a uh, system-wide effort, um, not just at Chittenden Correctional Facility, but throughout the, um, the, it's a tough job. And I've spent a lot of time talking to correctional officers working 16 hour shifts. It's got to change and we need to make it a more professional position and we need to do our best to improve upon the entire, uh, I would say, employees of the state of Vermont that work for the Department of Corrections should be recognized for the tremendous effort that they put in on a daily basis. I know that many of them are not um, ideal. It means better training, et cetera. Regarding the third and fourth questions, that's what justice reinvestment is designed to do. I'm a strong supporter and actually introduced bills on justice reinvestment one and two. Justice reinvestment is a way of reducing our prison population using a data-driven approach to try to ensure that those that are incarcerated are those that need to be incarcerated. And the money from uh, those savings should be reinvested in the community to provide support for folks uh, coming out, as well as those who, uh, so we can uh, reduce recidivism, but also uh, putting money in the in the in programs to help people that are on probation, parole, or who have never committed a crime but are likely to commit one through prevention. So. <clears throat> I'm a strong supporter of those, but that, that needs that we need to continue to reduce the population. Jim Baker has done a tremendous job of reducing the prison population. Um, part of it was obviously due to uh, the COVID crisis, but um, justice reinvestment is working, will continue to work, and we must uh, continue on that effort. So that's really my answer to the three and four. One other thing I really want to emphasize in terms of uh, the COVID response, um, you know, it, it was a difficult time uh, for all uh, folks who were incarcerated. It's, it's, you know, very difficult, and for staff as well. And I heard some of the comments, um, and I want a particular attention to those that are placed on detention, those who have not been convicted of a crime. We need to continue to find alternative ways to hold uh, these people accountable and responsible um, without using incarceration for people who are not dangerous. Um, that, that's one of the keys, but that's, you know, the corrections department doesn't hold up uh, a vacancy sign and saying, come on in. Um, those folks are sent by the courts and state's attorneys and others that need to pay particular attention to who we're holding on detention. Thank you, Senator Baruch. Yeah, um, I, I, I'll just say that when you're asked a yes or no question and you, re, and you reply yes with qualification, it makes you seem like a horrible weasel. Um, but I would just 
point out that there are differences between lawmakers and people such as the commissioner who are running agencies. Um, the people who are in the administration administer government and the budgets that they're given. Um, so the commissioner actually has the power to hire and fire um, and to make programmatic changes. You know, a proper understanding of our role is not to write a law that says a secretary or a commissioner must hire someone for a certain job. That's, that's really, in my uh, opinion, that's really a kind of micromanagement that we try to avoid. So how do we affect that? We hold hearings and we, uh, those of us who sit on uh, justice oversight, even in the off session, we're holding hearings and we're talking and dialoguing with commissioners and secretaries about how to achieve the goals that you're talking about. So I definitely believe that our corrections officers need more and better training. I definitely believe that we need to put more money into stepping people out of correctional facilities. Uh, I will say because he didn't, Senator Sears has been a champion of that for years. Um, and in our committee, we talk about it constantly, how to improve the experience and, and the recidivism rate as people are let out of the facility. Someone mentioned the main system and the step-down facility they have for female inmates. And uh, that's something that in justice oversight, we've had several presentations on and we've talked about that as a model for a facility if we build a new one in Vermont. So I'm in line with all of your uh, ideas, all of the programmatic changes that you talked about, I will work to see come about. I just can't um, say in advance of seeing other budgetary needs that yes, I support any amount for this because I'll, I'll be asked 15 or 20 times before January by 15 or 20 groups, will you commit to spending $100 million on climate change? Will you commit to spending this amount? And I, I think it's, uh, it's a certain kind of fool who promises that in advance of doing the homework and the hearings. So um, I'm with you in terms of doing what I can in good conscience promise right now. Senator Hooker. Well, it was good to follow Senator Baruth because I think that he speaks um, words of wisdom when he talks about needing to know more, to be able to um, find out more about uh, what is happening and how things are happening. But to address the first, your first question, I would like to know more about the director of Women and Family Services and why that position was um, eliminated. And uh, that would help me to understand more because on first blush, I'd say, of course, it's my understanding from the limited knowledge I have that it made the process more efficient for coordinating services for women who are incarcerated. So certainly that is something that I would support. And I'd like to know more about why it was eliminated. Um, with regard to training, uh, I don't know that we can ever have enough training uh, for people who are working with residents uh, in our institutions. And certainly um, that would be something that I would support. But again, it's, there are so many variables as far as money and um, whether or not we have the staff, for one thing. When, when you mentioned Maine, I was thinking what a wonderful model this is, but do they have the same situation, the same um, problems with staffing that we've heard talked about um, that Senator Sears uh, referred to? Um, the third question, I've lost it, <laughs> uh, to commit to, more robust educational and therapeutic opportunities. Yes, I will commit to that. I, I'll commit to that, but not just in corrections. I'll commit to that for all, um, all of our, all Vermonters who are having issues with uh, mental health issues and who need to um, have access to 
educational opportunities. And finally, to commit to providing ample preparation and supports after release. This is something that I am very concerned about, and I've spoken to Commissioner Baker about it, especially with the re-entry of people who have been incarcerated and what we're providing for them, um, whether we have congregate housing for them, where, where they're able to uh, ease into society again so that they have uh, structured um, time, they have people who are there helping them uh, whenever they need it as opposed to the scattered housing. And I don't, I don't think that um, independence is something that shouldn't be the goal, but I'm wondering if the immediate um, release into a place of, of their, excuse me, of their own, um, rather than to a place where they have some um, support is a good idea. So those are some of the things that I've been thinking about and certainly have a lot more to learn. Uh, I am uh, looking forward to our meeting tomorrow on justice oversight to speak more to these problems. Thank you. Reliance. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us and I'll I said yes to every single one of those questions, and I'll tell you why. Um, several years ago, I called a press conference together about a report about the Chittenden Regional um, Facility, and the, the report indicated some really unhealthy conditions uh, that in that facility and the concerns that uh, were expressed in your DRM report uh, were consistent in that report. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. It gets a little bit frustrating after a while to see this facility stay be static. So when the women were in the Northwest Correctional Facility, they had um, educational opportunities. They could learn new skills. They, uh, of course, they weren't as close to, most of them as close to their families as it would have been uh, nice to be, but uh, at least there were some of those opportunities available. And I'd like to see that return to this correctional facility. So overall, uh, I have a level of frustration with the slowness of change for this particular, for care of our um, incarcerated women. So going to your questions, um, Yes, uh, Director of Women and Family Services would seem to be very appropriate. Uh, family services isn't just uh, a services for women, but it's also for men with families. And so there, this is someone who could uh, coordinate opportunities system-wide, not just in this one facility. And I think that that's pretty important um, for those who are incarcerated. Uh, you know, we do have um, a director of trauma-informed services in our agency of human services. We also have a chief prevention officer in the in the office uh, in the governor's office, in the executive branch. Those folks really do understand uh, trauma-informed educational opportunities. We should be, I think, using their services uh, a great deal more in helping to flesh out some of the educational or training opportunities for those who are in our corrections facilities. It, it, they, it would seem to me um, that they're, the training that goes on for, uh, le to learn about trauma-informed uh, opportunities, education, wellness, uh, is throughout the agency of human services and the DOC is fu fully a part of our agency. So I would see um, directing some of the work that those folks do toward our um, corrections facilities, including the women's facilities. Um, educational and therapeutic opportunities. Really, this opens up a whole area. Therapeutic opportunities opens up the whole discussion about MAT 
that Senator Sears has worked very hard on and I, that I, I would like to say I, I feel I've contributed somewhat to that. But, but having, um, having extended opportunities for people to uh, be removed from their addiction while they are incarcerated and then support services afterward into our recovery centers to allow these people to um, folks who are addicted to get the services that they need, that is absolutely critical. One of my pet peeves around healthcare is that the system of care in our, in our corrections facilities may be different from what folks uh, are eligible to receive out in the community. It's a tough nut to crack, and I know that uh, Commissioner Baker is probably interested in this one as well, but um, moving toward a more robust uh, healthcare system or treatment opportunities for those who are incarcerated is, is very important. Two primary care visits, uh, three primary care visits, having people receive the type of care that they would receive if they were not incarcerated uh, is something we should, um, we should try to do. So, um, and I think, uh, and then that would include mental health, you know, because mental health services are ongoing care needs. <laughs> All of these things are ongoing care. You can't just go in and visit with someone for one visit every three months and expect them to, uh, to heal themselves. That's not going to happen. So having a ro more robust wellness environment uh, is, is very important. And I'm glad that you um, brought that up. And then, um, uh, well, the commitments for release. Um, yes, I've mentioned recovery services, but also housing. And I'm sorry, I'm going on and on because- No, no I'm sorry. What you're saying is very valuable, but we, we just uh, have a limited amount of time. So. There you go. Thank you. Senator Parent. I would just remind folks that Kathy is trying to uh, hold up a yellow 30 second sign and then a red um, stop sign. Yeah, I won't, I won't take too much time. I, I answered most of these uh, yes with qualification. Um, I think very similarly to uh, the way Representative Wood looks at it. I, I haven't served on a, a policy committee with, uh, with corrections. Um, you know, I just spent my first year on institutions in the Senate, which really, you know, we, we looked at some of the physical uh, structures, but, you know, when I look at all four options, you know, there's nothing that's glaring to me that, you know, I sit there and I go, geez, I, I don't think I could support that concept. It's just a matter of becoming more comfortable with the information out there. And, you know, you know, you know it was, it's been mentioned, I think, by Senator Hooker, why did we get rid of the director of women in the first place? And, and understanding some of these policy decisions um, before we, we implement them. Um, you know, I will highlight, I, I know it's different, but I, I represent a district that has Northwestern Correctional Facility and I you know, haven't really spent much time there, although I drive by it all the time, um, except my first year in the house when the governor at the time wanted to get rid of the community high school or, or defund community high school. And, and we went and saw how important that was to that facility as well as the folks in there who were, were getting real skill, you know, were you know, in the automotive program could walk out of um, you know, into local car dealerships and make over at the time $20 an hour. And, you know, this was now seven years ago and it was, that was a decent amount of money. And, um, and, and so I see the importance of, you know, the, the educational and therapeutic opportunities uh, too. I have a lot of corrections officers in my district and, and understand the stress that they're under, uh, especially in the last year with, with COVID and, you know, Northwestern had, was really impacted. So, I think the more we can do to train them uh, and mentor them and, and, and help them kind of work through their careers um, so they remain healthy, you know, after their careers as well. I think, you know, I, I'm related to a few law enforcement officers and, and folks who are in the New York State correction system as, uh, as officers, and it takes a toll on them by the time they get into their 50s and, and potentially even 60s. So um, I think we need to do everything we can to, to make sure they can have a a, a career and a, and a life after their career. So I'll end it there, but I look forward to working with this group. And um, tomorrow is our first committee uh, on, on justice oversight, the first meeting I'll be a part of. So, you know, looking forward to learning more and working with my colleagues to, to implement these as we can. Representative Wood. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess one of the things I'll just do is to echo pretty much what everybody else has said, my colleagues in the Senate. Um, 
I'm uh, vice chair of the House Human Services Committee uh, and have been on that committee for, um, this is uh, the fifth year. And my, my first year I did serve on House uh, Corrections and Institutions. So um, I did have some background there as well as working at the Agency of Human Services when I was in state government. Um, but one of the things uh, coming with it, uh, human services background is thinking about what are the human qualities do we look for in the people who work in our correctional facilities? Um, and uh, coming back to those human qualities, uh, I think are things that um, I know that Commissioner Baker is, is looking at and focusing on. And, um, you know, I, I can't help um, but feel a, a sense of sadness around the eight women who um, lost their lives after they were um, discharged from the facility um, to, to substance use and really thinking about how little, frankly, we support our community substance recovery programs. And we need to broaden our support of recovery programs. I know for a fact that there are recovery programs out there wanting to focus on um, particularly um, women um, who've been incarcerated with substance use disorders. And um, we, we have not put the resources into that and we need to own that and we need to think about how we will do better. So I'll just um, be brief and um, look forward to working on these issues with the um, Oversight Committee. Thank you. Commissioner Baker. Thank, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll go through the questions. I mean, a lot of information covered tonight and we don't have time for me to, to talk about some of the things that we are doing um, that directly affect some of the things I heard tonight. So it's, it's always difficult for me to um, listen to the stories of individuals that spend time um, incarcerated in our systems. The, 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 you know, most of the legislators here have heard me say this. Um, you know, the, the Vermont statute talks about when someone's incarcerated, that they're in the custody of the commissioner of corrections, and that's me. And, uh, you know, I, I take this very serious. Um, I take it very serious that um, I, I have people in my custody that are somebody's children, wives, parents. I, I take that very seriously. So I just kind of want to put that out there because there's a lot of information here tonight. But let me let me talk specifically to the four questions. First of all, we are in the process of filling um, the position um, of, of the uh, women and family services. Now, I don't know why it was cut. I understand just listening to historic conversations about what went on. But if you, if you do the math in 2015, it was one of those years where uh, budget cuts were occurred. And uh, my understanding is it was cut as a result of a budget cut. Um, we're not looking to come back to the legislature or to the governor for more money. We're working internally to figure that out. Um, we're looking internally to figure that out that usually means that we convert a position, but we are in the process of putting together the, the way this is gonna look. Um, second of all, uh, on, the, on the issue of trauma-informed, gender-informed training, we do that now. We've been doing it for years. Uh, we do it at our basic academy. It's we through all our training. Um, we've been doing it for a number of years. Here's what the problem is, is that the uh, curriculum has not been looked at in a number of years. And right now we have um, the Moss Group looking at that curriculum. Um, as far as, far as uh, uh, active, as far as uh, de-escalation skills somebody brought up, I can tell you from being in the justice field for 45 years in Vermont, the Vermont Department of Corrections by far, by far has the best active listening skill training that I've ever seen. Um, so we do that now uh, and we're, we're looking at the curriculum now. And, and I guess the, uh, the red card is up, so um, I, I may be out of time, but I certainly would uh, be willing to, to address the other two questions if there were, there were time. Thank you all. We are grateful to the commissioner and legislators for their responsiveness to our questions. And thank you again to our neighbors with lived experience for sharing their stories. We would like to encourage all of you on the call tonight to take part in next steps. To help us frame what those might be, 
we've asked the Reverend Stan Baker to summarize what we've heard tonight and give us a charge. So, thank you, Fran. Um, we heard significant research that was done by our group and reported by Linda Wentworth, um, particularly looking at, at CRCF, talking to women there, talking to legislators, talking to people who are experts and also to people in Maine about their programs. Um, we, uh, Linda talked about the Maine model, which is a wellness-based model based on physical and emotional and spiritual health and wellness, which is something we would like to see here in Vermont to be, ha have take the training that's already in place and expand that. We talked about the need for the reinstitution of the director of women's programs, um, women's and family programs, and it sounds from Commissioner Jim Baker as though that is happening. So that is good news to all of us. We focused on a need for a culture change throughout the system, which would mean much better training, not just training, but support for corrections officers uh, in order to change the culture of the system itself. Um, we talked about the need for education opportunities and training opportunities within the system and outside the system, collaborating with local businesses and nonprofits. We would like to see a um, at least nine months before dis release uh, to have release pr pl uh, planning in place and perhaps a step down house for women. Uh, one thing that we we talked about in our group in our uh, deliberations was planning for discharge from the very first day that someone enters the correction system. Um, we had some specific recommendations about access to the internet um, as well as um, continuing to bring back and support some of the outside groups that have been helping in the prison, uh, Mercy Connections, Vermont Works for Women's, Women, the DIVA program, and some others as well. Um, we heard testimony from Tammy Wood, an AA member and uh, the Corrections Chair for State AA, about how difficult it is to bring meetings into the facility and her fears that there may be some loss of um, space for that. We heard from Carmen Dutia in a written statement read by Sue Brooks, who lived in CRCF and convicted and unsentenced for three and a half years. She gave do details of what it was like to be there during COVID um, and the lack of outside contractors being able to come in and the inability to move around. She did say that uh, Jim Baker spoke to the legislature about the difficult emotional effects of isolation, and she was very sad about those who were lost to substance abuse afterwards. Tiffany, in her interview with Heather Newcomb, talked about giving birth and then having to go back to the prison mat after that, which was heartbreaking. The lack uh, of very slow access or no access to therapeutic programs, particularly having to do with substance abuse, her view was that incarceration makes things worse. We heard from our legislators um, who we're delighted are here. Um, and um, Senator Baruth, Senator Sears, I'm sorry, um, stated the need to focus on all the Department of Corrections programming in Vermont, um, feels that the justice reinvestment um, bill is designed to do some of the things we're asking for. He feels the need to reduce the prison population and to have alternatives to incarceration. All of the senators and representatives answered yes with qualifications, with need for more information. Um, and some of the things they asked for was that they would like to seek themselves is more and better training, uh, how to step people out of the correction system, to learn more about the director of women and family programming, and to know about budgetary needs because there are so many uh, budgetary needs. And that is their job. Um, I, they, uh, people all were willing, I think, to commit to more robust educational and training opportunities while women are incarcerated and also upon release. Senator Jenny Lyons spoke passionately about her own experience in commissioning a report on CRCF and um, said, the more things change, the more they stay the same and would really like to see things move forward and change. Both Senators Corey Parent and Representative Teresa Wood are new in the Justice Oversight Committee and are learning, but seem to be in favor of most of the things that we're asking for, but also need more information. So our charge is to continue to monitor things that are happening at the women's prison and in the Department of Corrections in general, 
and to, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> um, I had it right here. Um, to re, it's not, to, we want to see the women's director of women's programs reinstituted. I think that's happening. We continue to want to monitor and support culture change throughout the system, both in terms of training for corrections officers and to make sure that people are basing that training on gender identity and trauma issues. We want to focus on education opportunities within the system and bring pe more people in from outside the system and make sure that release is being planned for at least nine months before training and support. And um, we will continue to watch, support, help, and inform. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Thank you again for coming today. By being here, we all have demonstrated that we value a Vermont where every person deserves to be treated with respect and dignity and we are willing to work together to make that vision a reality. Two quick announcements before we end. First, if you are not already involved with Vermont Interfaith Action and would like to learn more about us, please write your name in the chat with interested in BIA and one of our staff will contact you. Second, a reminder to the organizing committee to stay on this Zoom call after everyone has left for a brief evaluation session of this evening's event. Now, the Reverend Earl Cooperkamp will lead us in a closing reflection. Thank you. Uh, my sisters and brothers, a couple of weeks ago, I was able to take part in a uh, racial justice and racial healing uh, uh, training. Uh, and during this time, we read uh, from the great uh, 20th century African-American theologian, Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman, uh, I found out, had spent uh, uh, some time with Mahatma Gandhi back in the mid 1930s uh, before Gandhi was widely known in this country. It was really through some of Thurman's works that uh, the works of Gandhi and the uh, ideas of nonviolence came into the civil rights uh, uh, struggles of our, uh, our own nation. Interesting though, Gandhi had spent time in jail in his 21 years in South Africa fighting the white supremacist uh, Boer regime, and then later in his 25 years fighting for independence from uh, the British uh, uh, colonialism, he ran in uh, uh, with the authorities. And uh, he was in prison many times, both in South Africa and in India. As a matter of fact, in 1944, when his wife, Kasturbai, died, he was actually imprisoned at the time. Uh, he was only released later on because he had malaria and the British authorities were worried about the possibility of what uh, bad publicity they'd have if he actually died in their custody. Luckily, uh, what, once he was released, uh, Gandhi did recover and lived uh, four more years till his assassination. One of the profound things that uh, Gandhi said, and uh, uh, Dean uh, Getline and I did not actually both plan on using uh, Gandhi, or we didn't uh, coordinate using Gandhi together tonight, but uh, I think it just uh, really fits the atmosphere. So uh, Gandhi said, and I think very profoundly, that relationships are based on four principles, respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. And I think those four principles also underlie our own understanding with Vermont Interfaith Action of restorative justice and the need for culture change, especially in the Department of Corrections. That uh, restorative justice is based on those principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. And of course, one of the most memorable things though that Mahatma Gandhi said was how it is that we as a society measure ourselves. What is the standard when we talk about the social issues that we face that we can understand to be that which will be judged? And Gandhi said, the true measure of society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. So I wanna leave you with that tonight. And I think as we begin to make these changes here in Vermont, we understand that this will be how we are remembered for the true measure of our society as well. Thank you. Thank you and good night.